for other people, I don't care that I was abused as a child. I don't care that my dad was an alcoholic. I'm going to show them that I'm going to succeed despite that. Trying to prove to the world, F you, you can't keep me down. Nir Ayal. Nir Ayal. Author, speaker, and investor. He has an MBA from Stanford, selling over 1 million copies in over 30 languages. But for the vast majority of people, they're not addicted. What they are is distracted. But I don't want to say that I'm distracted because now I have to do something about it. So the way the brain gets us to act is by creating this, this itch, this desire, this lusting, this craving. So checking email when you're yeah. supposed to be working on that big sales presentation, that's a distraction. Oh my God, uh, I'm feeling stressed. Escape, escape, stop feeling stressed, stop feeling anxious. No, lean into the anxiety, lean into the discomfort. But, no, but where do we learn that? So what do people do? They drink it away. Yeah. They drug it away. They click it away. So what does that do to your psyche? Day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, you said you were going to do this and you didn't do it. Loser. Loser. How can we use our discomfort to move us towards traction? Absolutely. Yeah. And this is what we see among high performers. I see a lot of people like blaming social media and saying like this is what they are doing to us they are making us addicted right. you know like uh, when you hear these kind of comments how do you feel about it so uh, did you see this movie The Social Dilemma yeah okay yeah. so yeah very popular film and uh, I was interviewed for that movie mm. I sat with them for three hours in a big studio and I, they interviewed me for three hours and uh, did you see me in the movie I wasn't in the movie uh, I'm in the credits. You can see my name in the credits, but I'm not in the movie. Mm. Uh, why? Because ironically enough, this film, these people who made this film, use the very same psychological manipulation tactics that the social media companies use on you, they use in the movie. Like what? Fear, right? Fear sells. Uh, the first rule of journalism, if it bleeds, it leads. So what you want to do if you want to get people uh, to watch your movie and not you know, go do something else, you scare the crap out of them. Yeah. And that's what they did. You know, these terrible images that they use in the movie of uh, your brain is a puppet on a string and they're manipulating you. And I mean, even the, the movie posters, it's, it's, it's almost like if you call, you know, most people think that social media is, uh, sorry, that the social dilemma is a documentary. That's what the category is on Netflix. Uh, it, but that's like calling Jaws a documentary about sharks. Yeah. It's highly sensationalized. So, you know, not only do they use the psychological manipulation tactics, Mm. That the social that they blame the social media companies for showing you, you know, getting you aggravated and agitated, not showing you both sides of the story. They did not show you both sides of the story yeah. in the social dilemma. Yeah, right. They interviewed yeah. me for four, for four, three hours. None of what I said made it into the movie. Why? Because it doesn't make for a good story. It doesn't make for nuance. So when someone doesn't want to show you the other side of the story, that's a problem. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah. I will tell people, of course, social media is influencing your behavior. That's what it's designed to do. It's meant to be entertaining. Right. I know yeah. how they get you hooked. I wrote the book hooked. Right. <laughs> and so I know everything what they yeah, do. Yeah, yeah. But the nuance here is that these techniques are good. They're not that good. And I think that's where we go overboard with with the, the popular narrative. It's a narrative that people want to believe. We yeah. want to believe we're addicted. We want to believe that, uh, you know, that, that there's nothing we can do. Why? Because when I say I'm addicted, the word addiction comes from the Latin addictio, which means to uh, uh, enslave. It literally means slave. And so when I believe I'm a slave, there's nothing I can do, it's not my fault. It's not my responsibility. Zuckerberg is doing it to me. But for the vast majority of people, they're not addicted. An addiction is a pathology. It's a disease, yeah. right? The vast majority of people are not addicted. What they are is distracted. But mm. I don't want to say that I'm distracted because now I have to do something about it. <laughs> That's no fun. Oh, my kids use social media nonstop. Uh, they're, they're addicted. What can I do? Yeah. But when I say, wait a minute, my kids are using social media nonstop because I keep giving them the device because I can't stand listening to them whine mm -hmm. and I can't stand being here with my own thoughts and thinking about my own problems. So I need to escape them comp constantly. Yeah. Ooh, that's no good. <laughs> <laughs> right. And so, um, that, that's, you know, just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the, the feelings, you know, just to get back to the social dilemma movie, for example, just to criticize that a bit more. Um, <laughs> it's as if, you know, you walk into the doctor's office and the doctor says, you have a horrible disease. Oh, that's awful. That's awful. But I have a cure. Mm. Oh, okay. Well, great. Give me the cure. No, I'm not going to give you the cure. It, it's, that would be medical malpractice. And that's exactly what this movie did. They mm. scared the crap out of people. Mm -hmm. And I will admit, it's good to be aware yeah. of how the, uh, that, that's what Indistractable, my second book is all about, yeah. right? But without giving the solution 
And the solution is not that hard. The reason they didn't put the solution in the book or in the movie is because anybody can do these solutions. Yeah. Right. I hate to tell you this. Yeah. Yeah. It's not that hard. Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. If you know, indistractable is what two hundred fifty pages. It'll take you a couple hours to read. And I promise you, unless you have some kind of underlying pathology, uh, anyone can become indistractable. Yeah. Uh, but they didn't put that in the movie because then you would say, oh, wait a minute. that's Maybe it's not a problem. There's stuff I can do about it. <laughs> mm. So, mm. yeah, be very careful about um, people who want to scare you into action. Mm. I really like that. And also, I think, like, with that kind of narrative, people are trying to put it away, something that is in their control. And right. So when they, they say they're addicted or they're blaming someone, it's not about themselves, but there's a, a, a responsibility, individual responsibility. Right. But the truth is, it, we are s getting a lot distracted. Mm -hmm. Why are we getting distracted? So let's define what is distraction, mm. first of all. What does that mm. word really mean? Because yeah. you know, we, we tend to toss around words without, without really yeah. establishing the, the definition. So I'm kind of a word nerd. Uh, so, <laughs> so the best way to understand what distraction is is to understand what distraction is not. Mm. Okay, so what is the opposite of distraction? Most people will tell you the opposite of distraction is focus, mm. but that's not exactly right. The opposite of distraction, if you look at the origin of the word, uh, the opposite of distraction is traction. Of course mm. it is. Think about it. Traction, yeah. distraction. Yeah. They're opposites. Yeah. yeah. Both words come from the same Latin root, trahare, which means to pull. Mm. And they both end in the same six letters, A-C-T-I-O-N. That spells action. So traction, by definition, mm. is any action that pulls us towards what we said we we're going to do. That's mm. traction. Distraction is any action that pulls us away from what we okay. said we were going to do. Things that move us away from our values and away from becoming the kind of people we want to become. So that I think that's a really important dichotomy because it's not about the behavior itself. Mm. It's about the intent behind the behavior. So as opposed to what most people do, the simple-minded people, they say, it's whatever I was doing instead of whatever else. So mm -hmm. it was my phone, it was uh, the news, it was Twitter, it was this, it was all this stuff outside of me. That's bad, that must be the cause of the problem. But that's ridiculous, because mm. people have always been struggling with distraction, right? 2,500 years ago, Plato, <laughs> the Greek philosopher, yeah. was talking about distraction. He called exactly. it akrasia, the tendency to do things against our better interests. So it can't be caused by technology, because this is not a new problem. It's been here for 2,500 years that people said, mm. oh, I'm so distracted. So we need to stop moralizing and medicalizing mm -hmm. these behaviors. If you want to go on YouTube or listen to a podcast or um, play a video game, great. There's nothing wrong with the behaviors. There's yeah. nothing wrong with these products. It's simply that we need to use them on our schedule and according to our values, yeah. not someone else's, certainly not the tech companies. So if you intend to go do these things mm -hmm. in advance with mm -hmm. intent, enjoy. You shouldn't yeah. be guilty about it. Conversely, just because something is a work-related task doesn't mean it's not a distraction. Mm -hmm. So we think of somehow as, you know, work tasks are virtuous. Ooh. But that can also be a distraction. Yeah. Think about it, right? So when I used to sit at my desk, I would say, okay, now I'm not going to be distracted. I'm going to focus. I'm going to work on this big task I've been procrastinating on. I'm going to get started right away. Here I go. But first, let me check some email. <laughs> right? I would justify it to myself and say, well, I have to use email at some point today. So that's a good behavior. That's okay. I'm not getting distracted. Yeah. But if it's not what I said I was going to do in advance, it's just as much of a distraction. I would argue it's a worse distraction because you don't even realize you're distracted, right? So checking email when you're yeah. supposed to be working on that big sales presentation, yeah. that's a distraction, mm -hmm. even though it's a work-related task. So I think the important thing here is to, to differentiate between traction and distraction. Traction is what you said you were going to do with your time ahead of time and distraction is anything else. So now that we have that, we can set the stage for what is distraction. Now we can talk about, okay, are we more distracted per your question? Yeah. And I would argue that we're actually not more distracted. And how do I know this? That historically, not only is there Plato, we know that you know, if you look at the work of, of, uh, 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 of monks, you know, Byzantine monks, they were also complaining about how distracted they were, <laughs> right? That yeah. in fact, we need to reshape how we think about distraction. I think the feeling of distraction is a luxury. Being distracted is a luxury. If, if you were unlucky enough to be the 99.9% .9 of human beings who have ever lived, who were living hand to mouth, you know, subsistence agriculture, uh -huh. and before that, you know, hunter gatherers, you were kind of busy all day, <laughs> right? You yeah. were finding food, you were trying to keep your kids alive, you were, uh, you know, escaping being prey uh, mm. from some animal that wanted to eat you. You didn't have time to be distracted with Facebook. 
Yeah. This is a, an incredibly uh, luxurious position. Who were the kind of people who were distracted? You know, when we think about Byzantine monks, we know that they were writing. They had lots of writings about yeah. how difficult it was to stay focused on their prayer and how they were fighting the distraction, not of social media. This was, you know, hundreds, if not thousands of years ago, uh, about all the, you know, their own thoughts and, yeah. uh, you know, all the potential distractions that they had. So it's really th that we have come to a point in human history where we have the luxury of leisure time in order to yes. even be entertained with, with, with uh, these potential diversions of attention, which could be distractions. So the, the rule here should be you can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. I'll say that again. You can't call something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. So if you look at your calendar, <laughs> right? Love if you look it. at your calendar and you've got a bunch of white space, yeah. it's empty. What did you get distracted from? Nothing, mm -hmm. right? You didn't decide in advance what you were going to do. So there's, there's four steps to becoming indistractable. The second one is making time for traction, is actually putting in your calendar yeah. in advance, this is what I want to do. Now that's, but that could be playing a video game, that could be watching YouTube videos, that could be on social media, that could be listening to a podcast, whatever it is you want to do, whatever it is you want to do. Mm. As long as you plan for it, it's not distraction, it's traction. I love that. Everything else is a distraction if that's not what you said you were going to do ahead of time. Yeah. But, but I think that, that before we going into, in, into solutions, it's interesting, like, but how do I understand if I'm distracted or not? What mm. is distracting me? Mm. How do I know that? The only way is to decide in advance what is traction, so you know what is distraction. Mm. So this is where uh, this technique of, of um, uh, planning your day by turning your values into time. So that's that's a, a huge lesson of, of uh, that, that, you know, I wrote the book for me more than anyone else. I was getting distracted. So I, and I read other people's books on the topic and you know, you got a bunch of professors with tenure telling you stop using social media, stop checking email. Thanks stupid, I'm gonna get fired, right? Yeah. That's not a helpful suggestion to stop using email. Mm. Uh, come on, yeah. <laughs> you know what's gonna happen to your job. You know, professors can say that because they have tenure. Um, but those solutions weren't helpful for me or most people. So what I wanted was an approach I could use uh, that was, was effective but also practical for the real world mm. and so one of the most important techniques that i that i uncovered was to turn your values into time so what are values values are attributes of the person you want to become yeah values are attributes of the person you want to become so it's only by when we look at our values and i show you exactly how to do this in the book how do you figure out what your values are and turning those values into time mm. right if you want to see what someone's values really are if you want to see what your values really are don't look at what people say. Don't listen to what comes out of their mouth. Look at how they spend their time and how they spend their money. Oh. That's really what your values are, whether you like it or not. So unless you decide in advance, how would the person I want to become spend their time yeah. and turn those values into time on your schedule? If you, value, if you say friendship, oh, friendships are very important to me. Relationships, super important to me. Mm. But do you have that time in your calendar? Do you have time for your spouse, for your kids, for your family? Do you have that time for your best friends? Or do you give them whatever scraps of time are left over? Which means you won't do it. <laughs> yeah. So having that time in your schedule in advance is the only way to know what is traction. And then yeah. everything else is a distraction. I, I see, yeah. But it looks like, uh, I mean, everyone knows that it's important to exercise. It's important to eat well. Mm -hmm. It's important to build uh, uh, good relationships. But somehow we, we slip into distraction. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that happens? Because we don't make time for it. Yeah. We don't sit down and say, what yes. are my values? We think somehow the good relationship will just happen. Exactly. We think, oh, my career success will just occur. We think, oh, I'll just get into shape somehow automatically. No, that's not how it happens. If you look at high performers, which I, you know, I, it took me five years to write Indistractable, mostly because I kept getting distracted, <laughs> right? <laughs> Until I learned these techniques for myself. That's yeah. why it took me so long to write the book. But, you know, I would interview many people at the top of their game, you know, athletes, uh, celebrities, uh, business people. If you look across the board, they all use these techniques that I share in the book. Mm. They time box their day. If you look at successful people, they put in their day time to work on the things that are important to them, including time for rest, yeah. right? You can put in your day, and I, I do it, I suggest everybody does it, time for relaxation, mm. time to do nothing, time to be spontaneous. But if you don't plan that time, you're also not planning the time to work hard, the time to focus, the time to be fully present with your family. 
So it's really, you know, th this this technique of time boxing, I didn't make up time boxing. It's been around for decades. And in, yeah. in fact, it's the most widely studied time management technique, by far the most effective thing you can do. Way better than stupid to-do lists. To-do lists are one of the worst things you can mm -hmm. do for your personal mm -hmm. productivity if you use them incorrectly. Mm -hmm. But time boxing your day, planning out what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. This is called setting an implementation intention, according to the psychology literature. That is incredibly effective. But few people do it because when they do it, they have this fear that, oh shit, now I actually have to do that thing I said I was gonna do. If I put it on my calendar, now I actually have to work out. Now I actually have to focus on my book. Now I actually have to work on my business. And that scares people, right? A lot of people self-sabotage because they don't wanna do the hard work. So fundamentally, to answer your question, Ooh. yeah, to answer your question, you know, why do yeah. we get distracted? This is, this is super important. So before we can answer the question, why do we get distracted? Let's back up a level and ask ourselves, why do we do anything and everything? What's the nature of human motivation? Yeah. And so most people, if you ask them, you know, why do people do what they do? They'll tell you it's some version of carrots and sticks. It's some version of the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. But that's not true. That biologically speaking, everything you do, everything you do, you do for one reason and one reason only. And that is the desire to escape discomfort. Everything you do. So you know that scene in The Matrix? You watch The Matrix, right? Yeah. You know that scene in The Matrix where Neo walks into the room and the boy has the spoon, the spoon starts bending, and he tells Neo, he says, you know, imagine there is no spoon. So I'm gonna give you another moment like that. So you know carrot and stick. Mm -hmm. Here's that moment. The carrot is the stick. Mm. The carrot is the stick. Yeah. That all human behavior, even the desire to feel pleasure, is psychologically destabilizing. Wanting, craving, lusting, hunger. Yeah. The desire to feel good feels bad. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So the way the brain gets us to act <clears throat> is by creating this, this itch, this desire, this lusting, this craving. That is what pursue, that's what gets us to pursue what we're looking for. So when you understand that fact, that all human behavior it is, is a desire to escape discomfort, all human behavior, that must therefore mean that time management is pain management. That weight management is pain management. That money management yeah. is pain management. So distraction is not a moral failing. It's not a symptom of our society. Mm. It's not some plot. It's not that anything's wrong with you. You don't have a broken brain. It's simply you haven't learned the skill to deal with discomfort in a healthy way that leads you towards traction. So you're escaping it with distraction. That's all it is. It's just an emotion regulation problem. So what that means is that when you learn the skills to regulate your emotions, you're impervious. You become indistractable. Yeah. But, no, but where do we learn that? What, what yeah. class do we take growing up that teaches us how to deal with emotional discomfort? So what do people do? They drink it away. Yeah. They drug it away. They click it away as opposed to dealing with the real issue that we're trying to escape with discomfort. Look, if you can't sit with your family and not check your phone over dinner, that's not the phone. Exactly. There's something deeper going on. And so that's what we need to deal with. What's the deeper thing going on? Now, sometimes it's things you can fix. Mm. Sometimes you can't fix them, right? Boredom, loneliness, fatigue, uncertainty, anxiety, that is part of the human condition. Exactly. So if you don't teach yourself how to deal with discomfort in a healthy way, you're gonna do what distractible people do, just trying to escape it. Yeah. So that's step one. We, we jumped to step two <clears throat> earlier, but step number one is mastering the internal triggers or they will become your master. Because that is the true source of distraction. It's always a desire to escape an uncomfortable sensation. Yeah, I think out of your book, to be honest, that was my favorite part. Yeah. Master internal triggers. Mm. You know, for me in my, in my journey, I've been working a lot on how to handle my negative emotions. Mm. Yeah? Mm -hmm. and, and that's been a huge, huge part of, uh, of uh, uh, I spend a lot of focus on that. Mm -hmm. But then you push me to another level. Mm. You, you said something very interesting, which is, but how can you use that uh, discomfort mm -hmm. to move you towards traction? Right. And I was like, oh, that is interesting. Yeah. So how can we do that? How can yeah. we use our negative emotions, our discomfort to move us towards traction? Absolutely, yeah. And this is what we see among high performers. That if you look at you know, how many celebrity stories, artist stories, athlete stories have we heard where they say, I did this because mm. I grew up in a difficult family life. Because I had some kind of childhood trauma. So good. Right? Yeah. All the time. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting because society has moved 
you know, when I was a kid, people say I succeeded despite this. Mm -hmm. And now we've moved to a place where trauma has become something debilitating as opposed to something empowering. And I understand that's 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 easy to say, but harder to do. I get yeah. that, right? Because trauma trauma can be very very difficult. But I think, you know, what we see, interestingly enough, is that the same event, abuse, neglect, tr you know, any kind of trauma, for one person, can be the reason that they're stuck in life, the reason yeah. they abuse drugs, the reason that their rationale for why they screw up their life. For other people. It can be the reason they're trying to prove to the world, F you, you can't keep me down. I don't care that I was abused as a child. I don't care that my dad was an alcoholic. I'm gonna show them that I'm gonna succeed despite that. So that's how you can you, you can relate to this example of how people can use these same internal triggers. You know, high performers, the people who are at the top of their game, whether it's athletes, artists, business people, whatever, they also feel bored and lonely and indecisive and uncertain. They, they feel the same things we do, but they use that internal trigger as rocket fuel. They say, because I feel, like for example, and this was a huge shift in my mind. So I've been a professional author for over a decade. And let me tell you, every time I sit down to write, it's hard. <laughs> I don't want to write. It's really difficult work. And I've written thousands of articles, two bestsellers. It never comes easy. I don't, you know, people talk about habits. I don't know how you develop a writing habit. It doesn't make any <laughs> sense to me because a habit is something done with little or no conscious thought. Writing is always full of conscious thought. And all I want to do is check social media or check email or go do something else when I'm writing. But it wasn't until I changed my mind about that discomfort, right? That most people, when they feel bored, lonely, indecisive, insecure, they want to escape it. And that's what I was doing previously. Now I use it whenever I feel that discomfort. I say, ah, oh, this is a good sign. This is a good sign because what do I do? One of the techniques in the book on how to master internal triggers is to have what's called a, a mantra. And my mantra has been for the past several years that you know, whenever I feel these internal triggers around writing, I take a second, I close my eyes and I say, this is what it feels like to get better. This is what it feels like to get better. So when I can just repeat that mantra in my own mind that this is a good sign, not, oh my God, uh, I'm feeling stressed, escape, escape, stop feeling stressed, stop feeling anxious. No, lean into the anxiety, lean into the discomfort because now that means I'm doing something that other people can't do, right? If everybody could do, it wouldn't be special. Yeah. So it's because I feel discomfort that I know I'm on the right path. And so it's just a mental reassessment. It's just looking at that trigger differently, not as something to escape, but something to lean into. Yeah. So it's the power of reframing. That's, That's right. what you do. And you also you said something in uh, in your book, how you you used to get nervous before uh, uh, a going presentation, on going yeah. on stage. Absolutely. And how, how you frame it. Maybe you can share that. I found sure. it very, very inspiring. So I'm a professional speaker as yeah. well. That's a, a big part of what I do. And one of the traits you don't want as a professional speaker is to get stage fright. Yeah. And so uh, for years I would get on stage and uh, I'd have a, a racing heart and my armpits would start sweating and I'd start breathing quickly and I still actually experience all those same physiological responses. And for years I thought, you see, okay, you know what? Maybe I'm just not cut out for this. I'm not meant to be a public speaker. Uh, I'm no good at this because look, you know, I bet you that uh, famous speakers, they don't feel this way. And that's totally wrong. It's totally false. I was making up this story that said something about me and we see this all the time. We see, you know, we do this to ourselves constantly that we think somehow we are broken. But it's our framing of these physiological responses that's broken. Don't listen to the society that tells you that this is, you know, your inner soul speaking to you. Bullshit. That's not true. It's simply your framing of the reaction. And so when I uncovered this research on how to reframe these physiological responses, I told myself a different story. So now, you know, before this interview or before I'm about to walk on stage and talk to a thousand people, I still feel the same exact reactions. I still feel my beating heart. I still get sweaty armpits. I still start breathing quickly. But now I've reframed that the, the reaction to those responses. So what do I do now? Before I get on stage and I feel those same exact reactions, I tell myself a different story. I say to myself, oh, you know, my heart is beating quickly because I need more oxygen in my brain in order to deliver my best possible presentation. So, so now it's, it's, it's helping me. So right? It's not taking away from me. And we can do this with so many aspects exactly. of our life, right? That we can define the very difficult uh, e emotional responses that we do not control to our benefit. That this is happening not to me, but happening for me. 
Yeah, that was huge. I love that. Mm. And it, it has helped me a lot because now I also do a lot of reframing. And you can, as you say, we can use that not just for uh, presentation or any part in our life, you know. Mm. We can just reframe it to move towards traction. Right. That's exactly right. Well, I knew it. <laughs> <laughs> so good. But now let's bring the conversation into, okay, uh, how do I become undistractable? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. you already m mentioned, but tell us what are the, 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 the steps into becoming undistractable? Sure. So we've got traction, we've got distraction. Yes. We've got external triggers. The external triggers are the pings, the dings, the rings, anything in our outside environment that tells us what to do. This is what people tend to blame. It's my phone. It's my mm -hmm. boss. It's my kids. It's all this stuff outside mm -hmm. of me. But it turns out that external triggers only account for about 10% of our distractions. So only 10% of the time that we get distracted is because of an external trigger. The other 90% are what we talked about, these internal triggers. Loneliness, fatigue, uncertainty, anxiety. That's 90% of the time that you get distracted. 90% of the time that you check your phone, it's because of a feeling. So step number one is to master those internal triggers. If you don't do that first, None of the other life hacks and tips and tricks, the grayscaling, the phone, all that stupid stuff, none of that works if you don't first and foremost address the internal triggers because you will always find an escape if you don't understand the root cause of the problem. The root cause of the problem is an uncomfortable emotion. So that's step number one. Master internal triggers or they will become your master. Step number two is make time for traction. So that's what we talked about earlier, time boxing, figuring out what your values are and turning your values into time. That's step number two. Step number three is hacking back the external triggers. So even though they only account for 10% of our distractions, we can take care of these very, very quickly. So this is where we figure out how do we make an indistractable computer? How do we make an indistractable phone? What about the, the deeper stuff? So there's actually only two, people think the book is about, you know, tech distractions. That's part of it. But that's not the source of all of our distractions. You know, what about stupid meetings we didn't need to attend? What about when our kids, we love them to death, but kids can be a huge source of distraction. So what do we do with all of these external triggers, the things in our outside environment? So I tell you step by step by step what to do about the external triggers. Finally, the last step to becoming indistractable is to prevent distraction with pacts. A pact is a pre-commitment device. It's when we decide in advance how we will erect a firewall against distraction. It's the last step. So when we use these four steps in concert, master internal triggers, make time for traction, hack back external triggers, and prevent distraction with packs. When you do one small thing in each of these four yeah. strategies, anyone can become indistractable. Yeah, and maybe we can go a, a bit in detail now into some of the techniques. I mean, you sure. share so many in, mm. in the book, and a lot of them, they're very, very simple. Mm. Maybe you can tell us, like, what are three techniques that sure. we can implement straight away mm. in order to become indestructible? So I, I would say these four. So if you can do one yeah. small thing in each of these four things. So for example, let's take um, internal triggers. So if you can have a strategy in place, and in the book I give you a, a dozen different ones you can use, but the idea here is to have a tool in your toolkit so that when you feel that discomfort, mm. what are you going to do about it? Yeah. People kind of walk through their day <laughs> and say, okay, when I feel what I feel, I'll do what I want to do, which means you're going to get distracted from whatever the task is. Because uh, the things worth having in life are always on the other side of discomfort. Right? If you want to have a great relationship, you have to go through the crappy parts of that relationship. You have to make time for that partner to, to, to talk about the things that are not so fun to talk about all the time. If you want to have a business, if you want to have a podcast, if you want to write a book, if you whatever it is that you want to do professionally, it's going to take some hard work. Yeah. So figuring out how to regulate your emotions, which many of us hadn't had to do since we were children, right? figuring out what is in my way, how am I in my own way when it comes to these emotions and having a practice in place. When I feel bored, now I'm checking social media, but instead, what am I going to do? Mm. How am I going to regulate that emotion? So we talk about acceptance and commitment therapy in the book. We talk about the 10-minute rule. We talk. There's a dozen different things you can do. Very, very practical stuff. The next step is make time for traction. So if, if there's one piece of advice, you don't have to buy the book to know how to do this, planning out your day. Yeah. Because, uh, again, if you don't schedule your time, someone's going to schedule it for you. And you can't call some a something a distraction unless you know what it distracted you from. So I show you, know, for many people, that's very difficult. How do I plan my day? Like, things just come up. My kids need me. <laughs> my business partner needs me. Like, things just happen. I, I've heard every excuse, <laughs> okay? <laughs> it's, it, I've never met anybody who can't do this, even if your schedule changes a lot. Just planning out in advance what you're going to do and when you're going to do it. Even if some of that time is, you know, unknown, spontaneous time. That's fine. Like, for example, with my daughter, uh, every weekend, we have a three-hour block of planned spontaneity. That sounds like an oxymoron, right? Planned spontaneity. <laughs> Why would I need to do that? Why would I need to plan spontaneity? Because when I plan that time with my daughter, if it's not in my calendar, then I won't 
have that, that fortitude to say, okay, I know what I will not be doing. I will not be checking my phone. I will not be having a business phone call. I will not be on social media because I plan that time to be with someone I love very much. So having that time set aside, and I show you exactly how to do that as well. Uh, then you know, making sure you can hack back the external triggers. What strategy are you going to use to hack back those external triggers? So I use the word hack back because to hack something is to gain unauthorized access. So if someone was to hack into your bank account, you know, if a computer hacker hacked into your bank account, they're gaining unauthorized access to your bank account. Similarly, we know that media companies are hacking our attention, not just social media, all media is looking to hack your attention. Mm. Is, uh, you know, some war 5,000 miles away the most important thing you should be thinking about? No, <laughs> unless yeah. you're anywhere near that conflict, you can't do anything about it. And yet the news media is not gonna tell you that. The news media is gonna get you very scared about these, these, uh, these conflicts because that's how they make money. The more you watch, the more money they make. So hacking back those external triggers is what we should do. They can hack us, but we can also hack mm. them. So we're not powerless. We can change the settings on our devices. We can use media consciously. Not that it's bad, right? Mm -hmm. I, I read the news, I use social media, but I use it on my schedule, not theirs. So I show you exactly how to do that. And then finally, um, uh, preventing distraction with pacts. And there are three kinds of pacts. There's an effort pact, a price pact, and an identity pact. The, you know, I, I, just for the sake of time, the, the, the most important of those three is, is an identity pact. And this is a very interesting concept. It comes to us from the psychology of religion. Mm. That we know that when someone makes an identity pact, they begin to call themselves by a noun. It's who they are. Mm -hmm. They're much more likely to follow through on their goals. So for example, uh, a, a devout Muslim doesn't uh, contemplate eating uh, you know, a bacon sandwich for breakfast because that's haram, right? People, devout Muslims don't eat pork. Uh, if someone's a, a vegan or vegetarian, same way. It's who they are, it is yeah. their identity. There's a noun that says this is who I am. So the reason that my book is titled Indistractable is that indistractable is meant to sound like indestructible. It is who you are, it's your identity. So when you say I am indistractable, and you start telling others, mm -hmm. this is who I am, I am indistractable, it's my identity, you become much more likely to follow through on your long-term goals. So that's, a, that's an identity pact. And there's, of course, effort packs and price packs. So those are just some small techniques. Now, nobody does everything in the book. You don't have to. Mm -hmm. You just have to do one small thing in each of these four strategies. And once you have those four strategies in place, that's how you, anyone can become indistractable. Yeah, I think something that had a, a big impact on me, uh, on your work, was exactly the time blocking. Mm -hmm. So I still have a to-do list. We're mm -hmm. going to discuss that. Yeah, We're going to yeah, discuss yeah. that. But for, for me, when I started putting uh, like time boxing in having whatever I want to do, mm. I will time box in my calendar. Yeah. And that was a huge game changer it's for me. It's a big me. one. So yeah. thank, you for, uh, sure. thank you for that. Yeah. Uh, but in one of your uh, uh, posts on social media, mm. you mentioned that, uh, this is your quote, uh, you have been using uh, uh, to-do lists wrong your entire life. Right. What do you mean by that? So the way most people use to-do lists is they write down a bunch of aspirations uh, and mm. then they wake up in the morning and they say, what am I supposed to do with my time? Let me look at my to-do list. My to-do list will tell me. There's so many problems with that. Right, so many problems. And I used to do this too, by the way. One of the problems is that there's no sense of prioritization when it comes to a to-do list. There are no trade-offs. Mm. There's no constraint. Yeah. And you can say, okay, I'm gonna do this first, this second, this third. By the way, what most people do, what I used to do, I look at my to-do list and would I do the most important task? No, mm -hmm. I do the easy stuff. Exactly. <laughs> I do the urgent stuff. Yeah, yep. sometimes I would do a task and then go back and write it on my to-do list so I could check it off. How stupid is that, right? Because the way we measure ourselves with the to-do list is completely wrong. We measure our self-worth based on how many cute little boxes we check mm -hmm. off. Oh, now we're being productive. That is so dumb. <laughs> yeah. Because the instead of checking yourself off with like how many cute little boxes you check off, which which uh, incentivizes doing easy stuff yeah. and incentivizes doing urgent work, not important stuff that moves your career forward. The 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 biggest problem is that because there are no constraints, you can always add more mm. to a to do list. There's no constraint. You can have a to do list that's a mile long. You just add more and more and more and more and more. But that's not real life, right? Mm. Real life, we only have 24 hours in a day. So what happens, and this is what I call the tyranny of the to do list is you get home from work, you've been busy all day long, you've been working hard, and you look at your to-do list and you still have a million things you didn't do. So what does that do to your psyche? What does that do to your self-worth when day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, you said you were gonna do this and you didn't do it? Loser, 
Yeah. And so that's when people start thinking to themselves, oh, I'm no good at time management. I must have something wrong with me. No, there's nothing wrong with you. It's a stupid mm. time management technique that's wrong. Mm. So there's nothing wrong with getting things out of your head and onto a piece of paper or onto an app. That's fine. But that's step one. What you have to do is to add some kind of constraint. Exactly. So unlike a to-do list, which is a list of output, right? Here's all the things I want to have done. Output. Where's the input? Think about it, right? In a blue-collar job, let's say you're a baker, okay? And uh, a customer comes to you. I come to you and say, hey, I have a birthday party for my daughter. I need a dozen cupcakes, okay? Well, the baker's going to say, okay, I need flour. I need sugar. I need butter. I need all these ingredients in order to make the output, the input in order to create the cupcakes. What's our input as knowledge workers? What's our input? It's not butter and sugar and flour. We only have two th inputs, time and attention. That's it, yeah. time and attention. Yeah. Where is the input? We've got the output, that's the to-do list. Where's the input? The input is in our calendar. Mm. So it's not that to-do list per se, getting things out of your brain, that's great. Get them, yeah. get them onto a piece of paper. But that's like having a bunch of, of, of uh, orders for cupcakes without figuring out, well, where do I buy the ingredients? Where's the mm. input? So if you're not as the next step, going to your calendar and figuring out when will I do these things, you're never gonna do them or you're gonna do them poorly. So what we need to do is to totally reshift our metric of success. The metric of success is not, did I finish? This is a really important point because people, what do you mean? I have to finish. That's the whole point of productivity is finish it, right? <laughs> no, if you want to get more done, the best way to think through this is to not measure yourself by how many cute little boxes you checked off, but rather by one metric. And that is, did I do what I said I was going to do for as long as I said I would without distraction? That's it. Can you, not did can I finish. You, can you say that again? So did funny. I do what I said I was going to do for as long as I said I would without distraction? That's it. So if you say I'm going to work on this task for 30 minutes or an hour or whatever amount of time, did I just do that? Yeah. Just do that. Now, why is this so important? There's something called the planning fallacy, which shows us through many, many studies that on average, people take three times longer to finish a task than they estimate. Oh, shit. Three times longer, <laughs> right? Why does that happen? We've all seen this to be true, yeah. right? So, oh, okay, yeah, it's gonna, I'm going to finish this task. It's going to take me about 30 minutes. It takes me an hour and a half. Why? Because the way the average to-do list user works is they say, okay, I'm going to work on that. I'm going to make those slides. I'm going to work on this presentation. Okay, here I go. I start working on it for five minutes. And, oh, there's an email. And, oh, somebody needed me at my desk. Or, or, you know, somebody tapped me on the shoulder. Or, oh, I need to do this. And then, wait, what was I working on again? Oh, I forgot. So they're constantly stopping and starting and stopping and starting. It's like, it's like uh, uh, trying to go fast in your car with your foot on the brake. You're constantly doing this. Whereas someone who's indistractable, they say, I'm just going to work on this task for 30 minutes and nothing else. Just this task without distraction. Did I do that? Not did I finish. Did I work on that task without distraction? Now, mm. there's a feedback loop. Mm. Now, mm. I can tell, I can sh ask myself, okay, I worked on making those slides for 30 minutes and the presentation needs to be 30 slides long and I finished three slides. Okay, well, that means to finish the entire presentation, I need 10 more time boxes. Now, there's a feedback loop. And so I can start planning my time based on what it will take to get the output because I put in the input of having that time in my schedule. So just writing down on your schedule, mm. uh, on your to-do list, finish the slide presentation, that's dumb. Yeah. Rather, you need to put in your calendar, work on slide presentation for 30 minutes and mm. see how far I got. That's where you have the feedback loop. They don't give you the feedback loop. And worst of all, <laughs> there's more. There's more. <laughs> Worst of all, with a to-do list, even when you are relaxing, even when you think, hey, I've got some time off, you're constantly thinking about the things left undone, Yeah. right? Even when you're playing with your kids or on social media, you feel guilty about it because I should be doing that thing on my to-do list. Yeah. Whereas an indistractable person who uses time boxing, they have in their calendar, yeah, this is the yeah. time to spend with my kids. This yeah. is the time to go on social media. This is my time to listen to a podcast. It's in my schedule. <laughs> And anything else is distraction. So you can, you know, very few people have actually experienced the bliss, the joy of doing what it is you said you were going to do without guilt. And so you can only do that by planning the time in advance, not having it on your stupid to-do list. But for that, we need a lot of self-discipline, right? No, I actually, I think it's the opposite. You really? need self-discipline when you're constantly pulling yourself away right? I, I okay. want to be with my kids. I want yeah. to be on social media, but I should be doing something else. That takes discipline. Oh. That you're fighting with yourself. But when it says in my schedule, go on social media. Mm. 
where's the self-discipline there? It says yeah. I get to go on social media. I get to go have fun. Yeah. I get to be with my kids. It's on my schedule. So basically it's about, it's not about how many things you do out of your uh, to-do list that are very productive, but it's just to make sure that you do what you said you are going to do. Bingo. So my job, a lot of people out there say, oh, you should be spending more time yeah. exercising. You should be spending more time with your kids. You should be spending less time on social yeah. media. That's not what I'm doing. I see. I'm telling people, do whatever it is you want. You only have one life on earth here. Yeah. Do what it is you think is important. If you want to play video games all day, I'm yeah, not going to yeah. tell you not to. Yeah. If that's consistent with your values, awesome. Do it. Exactly. <laughs> Do it without yeah. guilt. So you, you, you wrote a book uh, you published in 2019. Mm -hmm. uh, you did five years of research. Mm. Uh, in the last five years, a lot has happened. Mm. If you would have to write the book again, what would you add to the mm. book mm. Uh, in order to become indestructible? <sighs> So I remember during, so the book came out 2019, COVID started in 2020. And I remember telling my wife during COVID, thank God I wrote this book because I don't know how I would have gotten through COVID uh, without it. Because there were so many emotions during COVID, right? We had the elections, we had all the stress of the, you know, of, the, of the pandemic. There was a lot going on. And all I wanted to do, I mean, I really had to test my material because all I wanted to do was check the news all day because yeah. it was such a yeah, scary yeah, time. Yeah. Why? Because there was more internal triggers bubbling up in us. Fear, uncertainty, anxiety. So the solution was, oh, check the news all day. But that, that wasn't, you know, there's nothing I could do about 99% of what was happening out there. Uh, so it was really helpful to have done this research before COVID. What's changed, uh, the underlying psychology hasn't changed. I wouldn't exactly. re rewrite that. I think what's changed since is that uh, work from home is new, right? Uh, luckily, mm -hmm. uh, right, when I wrote in 2019, nobody was, very few people were working from home. But I was, because <laughs> I, was I was an author you know, for, for over a decade now, so I'd had plenty of practice working from home. And we also homeschool my daughter. So whereas most people you know, tried homeschooling for the first time during the, in the pandemic, we'd been doing it for five years before. So um, I wrote in the book about how the challenges of working from home. And so what changed uh, was that the source of the, of the distraction changed. It went oh, from your boss being a distraction yeah. to your kids being a distraction. <laughs> but luckily I wrote that in the book. There's a section in the book on mm. you know what to do about external triggers from other people, even when you're working from home. Yes. So luckily that was in the book. So to be honest, I, I haven't come across anything that I would I would change. I see. Yeah. So it was more about what changed was more people are working from home. Right. But as you were also working from home, you also covered that uh, 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 in the book. That's we're right. coming to the end and uh, um, I have two more questions. Sure. Uh, so one is like, I even heard that the book helped you in your sexual life. <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> All right. We're going to get, well, we're going to go there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Sure. Can you tell us more how that happened? Yeah. Yeah. So um, <laughs> let's see. So while I was researching the book and again, I I wrote the book for me that I found that I was distracted in my own life and I wasn't living up to my values. And um, uh, one of the, the the costs of distraction was that uh, my sex life was suffering, frankly. That uh, my wife and I, we've been married now for 23 years. And uh, I noticed that night after night we were going to bed and she was caressing her iPad and I was fondling my iPhone and we weren't being intimate. Yeah. And so as I was doing this research, I came across uh, this technique uh, that, that is called making a pre-commitment, a pact. And uh, one of the pacts is called an effort pact. An effort pact is when you put some bit of effort, some kind of friction in between you and the mm -hmm. distraction. Mm -hmm. So what did I do? I went to the hardware store and I bought us this $5 outlet timer. And this outlet timer, you set it for whatever time of day or night, <laughs> and whatever you plug into it will turn off at whatever time you set. <laughs> So what did I plug into it? I plugged in our internet router and our so, computer screens. So good. So every night at 10 p.m., our internet shuts off yeah. for the whole house. Yeah. Now, could I turn the internet back on? Of course I could. I could use my phone. Mm. I could go unplug the router and replug it. I could find a way. Of course, that's not the point. The point is I added some friction. I added some effort to a mindless situation where I was just scrolling yeah, and scrolling yeah. and emailing or doing whatever I was doing online. Now I inserted some mindfulness to say to myself, wait a minute, do I really need to be doing this? <clears throat> or is it time to go to bed and spend some quality time with my wife? And I would be very happy to report sex life is back on track. <laughs> Things are much better and have been now for years. Uh, because of that simple, yeah, and, and to be honest, now that we've been doing it for so long, we don't actually even need exactly. that anymore. Because we know in our household, okay, 10 o'clock, 
that's that's time to yeah. start getting ready for bed and and you know s- stop scrolling and scrolling uh, again because it's just that bit of effort that reminded us okay be mindful about what we're doing here yeah. rechecking in with your values is that what's on your schedule by the way you know that's the last step okay? exactly making like getting the internet router that was the easy stuff hmm. the first step was figuring out the internal triggers what was this stress that I was constantly having to to escape by going online in the first yeah. place did I have it on my schedule you know I, I used to tell my daughter it's time for your bedtime you have to go to bed and then one day she looked at me and she said daddy do you have a bedtime <laughs> and she was absolutely right we've all heard about how important sleep is right you probably had guests on the show that have talked about sleep 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 yes but do you have a bedtime? Exactly. Is it on your, now I have a bedtime. It's yeah. on my schedule, yeah. right? And then hacking back the external triggers, removing those external triggers. So I used to have um, a television in my bedroom. Not anymore, right? Yeah. I don't want that external triggers. The bedroom is for sleep and sex, not for entertainment. Entertainment, yeah, yeah. go do in the living room. Go do somewhere else. That yeah. is a sacred space. That We need to have these no phone zones, right? So the reason you are constantly checking your device is because it's right there all the time. Exactly. We don't charge our cell phones near our bed anymore. It doesn't happen, okay? So removing those external triggers. And then finally, the last step is preventing distraction with these packs exactly. where we have this this router thing. Yeah, so this last is like the, the you, you need to do the first three steps before going to Pact. Pact exactly. is like kind of the, the last resort. The last resort. What that, most people do, they start with that <laughs> and then it, it doesn't work, right? You have to do the three steps first. Yeah, yeah. so good. Um, a lot of people they ask you a lot of questions, but what is one question that not many people ask you and you would love to answer? You know, I, I um, writing for me has been such a gift and I, I, um, I, guess, I guess that's something I would like people to know is that um, uh, I am not the kind of author that writes. So you see this a lot with academics, and this is why academics tend to write bad books. Not always, but most books <laughs> that come from PhDs are awful because they write what they know, Yeah. right? They research, 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 then they write what they learned. And uh, it's typically very boring. I don't write that way. I write what I want to know. Mm. Right, so I have a job because those academics are such bad writers. <laughs> so what I start is with a question. I only write books for problems I had. When I wanted to build a habit forming product and I didn't see a book out there on how to do it, I wrote Hooked, How to Build Habit Forming Products. Yeah. When I found that I was struggling with distraction, I read other books that didn't solve the problem for me by telling me stupid stuff like, well, stop checking email. That didn't do it for me. It didn't yeah, help yeah. fix the problem. <laughs> and so I wanted to write it for myself. So I wrote How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life because that's what I needed. And so I would encourage people like maybe the question is, um, how do you how do you learn? And I think mm. the way I would learn is by writing. Like it's a very unappreciated so tactic that uh, even if nobody reads it, like I honestly write. My best writing is when I write and I don't care if anybody reads it, because what I'm doing is I'm writing for myself. <laughs> I write in a very convincing way that that you know seems like oh I always knew this, but really it's that journey to write with authority where I learn. Because yeah, as I'm writing, yeah, I'm saying, yeah. mm, if I read this, you know, I don't know if I buy that. Uh, what if there's this alternative perspective and this research research says this, but that says something else. So it's in that process that I figure out what I really think. And so that's, that's I think, an underutilized technique is to write for yourself. <laughs> I love it. It's such a powerful tool for us and to even for clarity, you know, mm-hmm. for clarity to, to write. Near. I mean, thank you so much. I mean, first, I mean, your work is so good. Thank you. Thank you for putting out there that. so much uh, work that is helping so many people. And thank you for coming to the podcast and My sharing pleasure. so many great insights on how we can become undistractable. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.